In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start with one of the ministries that is near and dear to my heart, maybe one of the things that I will look back on my career and say was the most important thing that I ever did, and that's the internship program. Um, it, uh, for me, is just a source of great joy and pride and, and uh, a lot of work, a lot of effort. Of course, you are a part of that as well. Uh, as you teach in terms what it means to be pastor of a congregation as you engage with them. I don't know if you were here last week for Reformation Sunday to hear intern Ethan's uh, sermon. If you weren't here, you need to go online and listen to it. It really was uh, quite incredible. You might notice when the intern preaches that I go sit out in the congregation and I'm writing down things and typically what I'll do is I'll come back and I'll sit down and I'll, I'll lean over and say, okay, try not to do that again, uh, that part right there. And then maybe you can think about this ending and that part was really good and you know, we do some quick instruction on the fly while it's still fresh in your mind. Well, I came back after that sermon, sat down next to Ethan and I go, listen, Ethan, we do not expect that kind of sermon out of an intern until the last week of internship. <laughs> so it was really quite incredible. And that is one of my, again, my great joys is to work with them very closely on preaching. But again, you share that ministry so that now we have pastors who have been stamped sort of with the Calvary DNA, what it means to express God's heart through human hands, what it means to think about ministry mostly outside the four walls rather than inside this sanctuary as being what's primary to us. And so you've extended yourself out into the nation, in fact, around the world with Chaplain Kirsten going to Iraq and ministering to our soldiers over there. We've got interns in Ohio and West Virginia, Michigan and Wisconsin, out on the campus of Yale and Concord uh, on, in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, so they're ministering all over the place, Kirsten now in California. And because most of them are young people when they come and spend time with us, they'll be serving in congregations for 20, 30, 40, who knows, 50 years. Think of the multiplying effect of that ministry, that people are blessed because you took time to engage an intern to help teach them because you supported through your financial gifts a program that would be like an extra staff person. But that's what we're about here, giving of ourselves for the sake of others. It's what we do when we invite homeless men to come spend Tuesday night at Room in the Inn. Even though they come to this place, what we're counting on is that experience of getting good food, of being welcomed as real human beings means that the rest of their week will be a, a little less harsh, that they'll feel a little better about themselves and not be dragged down by the way that people look at them and talk about them, by the things that they have to do just to get a little bit of food or maybe some clothes. That's what we do when we commit to Mid-Cities Care Corps, elderly folks who can't get around anymore who wouldn't be able to get to the doctor's office or go shopping. People who just want someone to come and visit with them because they're lonely, living all alone, forgotten by perhaps family and friends. That's why we do that. That's why we build houses for habitat so that people who can't afford homes have shelter. That's why we make sure that the need shelves are always filled with food because you and I don't know what it means to go hungry. And so our only way of, of reaching out to those who do is to provide for them. It's what we do whenever we think about ourselves as a light shining in the darkness, as these hands, yours and mine, express the tender mercy of God's heart. It's what we do when we train our young people up in the way that they should go. We baptized a, a boy at the 930 surface, Grayson Blake, dressed up in a little tuxedo because it's an important event. And we rejoiced with Ashley, his mother, that he'll come to the Lord's house now and learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we train youth to be the leaders in the church today and also leaders in the future. It's why we go on mission trips. This year, we're going back to El Sanitzo, a little border town down by Laredo, where we spent five years and eventually built a sanctuary for the congregation of Agua Viva. I remember preaching about that endeavor, which was so far outside 
of uh, anything we could imagine, to build a 4,000 square foot sanctuary in 14 days. What were we thinking? The only way that it came to be was because the Lord blessed it at every turn. One of the things I remember most is uh, one of our members at the time, one of the young members, um, his name is Rusty Seeley. He was a big boy back then, played football, you know, and he's really a, kind of one of those guys you wouldn't expect to see this, but there he was sitting. He'd watched that building rise up out of the dusty ground, and he was weeping, tears rolling down his cheeks. I said, what's, are you okay? He goes, Pastor Phil, this is the most important thing I've ever done in my life. When I have children, I'm going to bring them here. I'm going to show them this and say, I built that. That week ended with a worship service. There were about 80 of us and 120 of the members of Agua Viva Lutheran Church. We gathered in the double-wide trailer that had served for their sanctuary for 20 years where the, the floor was given way and the air conditioners didn't work. There was no room for everyone to stand. We came to the point of the Eucharist. We lifted up the elements, the bread and wine, the body and blood, and we processed out of that double wide trailer across that dusty ground up to the door of this brand new sanctuary, 12 foot high ceilings, central air. We handed the key to the door to the president of the congregation and he turned the key and opened the double doors and the congregation streamed in. And we made a circle in that large sanctuary and we began to sing. We are standing on holy ground and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground there in that sanctuary the heavens were opened the saints in light rejoiced and two communities of faith who do not share an earthly language conversed in the language of faith and joy and friendship and peace and love all the good things that God has to offer that flow from God's heart, but that require human hands to reach out and touch so that the future comes into our present. J.D. Bailey was diagnosed with cancer only like three weeks ago. Had no idea that he was dying. They managed to get him home for his last days. His wife Mary says he had a huge sigh of relief when she said to him, you're home, J.D. They put his hospital bed in the center of the living room. And for a couple days, the family gathered around. Now, do you think that in that kind of setting, people would be very quiet, very reverent? But that's just not the way it is at the Bailey household <laughs> with grandchildren and children running all around and playing games and, I don't know, throwing tossing balls across J.D.'s body. They just were living life while he passed on into the life that is eternal. You see, they're both the same thing. That eternal life that waits for us, comes to us in the present. Whenever we stand on holy ground in sanctuaries or living rooms where the dying and the living spend time together every last moment, it is a sacred journey we share that we're able to walk up right to the edge and then bid farewell for a moment. Because truth is, all of us will know that day of perfect peace and joy gathered on the holy mountain where God prepares a rich feast of fat things, bread and wine, a multitude too great to count of every tribe, of every nation, of every race, of every tongue, 
And God dines on death forever, swallows it up so that pain and sorrow and suffering and separation are no more. And whenever you reach out and touch that, you live the future in the present and you start to make a difference in this world because we are tired that people go to bed hungry. We are tired that the elderly live alone and are lonely. We are tired that the homeless don't have a place of shelter and warmth and comfort and friendship. We are tired that some congregations work, worship in a double-wide trailer while others have a wonderful sanctuary. We're tired of waiting for the future. And so these hands express God's heart and the future comes into the present. And heaven is known to us and seen by us and touched by us and tasted by us so that we won't be surprised on that day when we get here and we see heaven looks a lot like the times that we were merciful and kind and loving in this world. It really is as simple as that. No one is ever lost to us. No one is ever lost to us. They're always present. And so, dear friends in Christ, on this Commitment Sunday, I'll invoke the memory of a saint who I miss dearly, especially on these Sundays. Those of you who know him, his name was Bob Pedersen. Bob Pedersen taught me my first year here at Calvary what stewardship is about. He says, it's, it's not about next year, Pastor Phil. The question is, will this church exist 100 years from now? So that's the question I ask always of myself. What I'm doing today, will it mean that when I come back to visit on All Saints Sunday, a hundred years from now, will there still be people here worshiping? I believe because of our faithfulness today, I can say without reservation, when Jesus Christ returns, whenever that day is, there will be a congregation on the corner of Booth Calloway and Baker Boulevard that is still expressing God's heart through human hands. And on that day, we will not be candles on the altar, for we will shine like the sun. So as you have been faithful in the past, be faithful in the present for the sake of the future. To that God, your glory, honor, and praise. Oh, amen.